today we are going to talk about the pulmonary volume and capacities this is the probably the easiest topic in pulmonary physiology right so let's start from here i draw a structure of lung here and let us suppose this is the volume of the air in the lung we are just supposing that this is a volume of the air in the lung when respiratory system is at rest. Now what is really meant by that respiratory system is at rest? It means that you are not doing any specific effort for inspiration or expiration. Right? When I say respiratory system is at rest, it means that that is the moment you are not doing any effort for inspiration or for expiration. Now, when respiratory system is at rest, what really happens? You know, your ribs, this is pose, this is vertebra, these are the ribs, here is the sternum, is that right? Let us pose, this is your skeletal cage around the lungs. And let's suppose I put the lung structure like this. It's a very simple diagram. I'm not showing the heart and other media sternal structures. Now look, what is this? This is your rib cage, is that right? And here it is lung structure. Now you must be knowing that lungs are basically elastic tissue, right? They can be expanded, and once they are expanded, they have a tendency to retract. Right, they do have a lot of collagen and they have a lot of elastic tissue. Right, due to that reason, they have a, once they are expanded, they have a tendency to require. Is that right? But at the same time, this rib cage, right, it also has a tendency to keep its specific size. Right, for example, my rib cage, if I do inspiration, I'm expanding my rib cage, but it has an automatic tendency to go to its neutral position. The question is that what is the neutral position for the rib cage and what is the neutral position for the lungs? First we have to understand. Now what I mean by the neutral position of lungs that we remove the lungs out of the chest wall and put it in the air. Do you think if you bring my lungs out of my body and put it here on my hands, my lungs will get smaller or larger? Yes. Yes my friend. If you are very ruthless and you bring my lungs out of my body and put it on my palms as compared to their size or volume in my chest cavity when you put it on the palm they will get larger or smaller or they will remain the same size yes they will get smaller. that's very important to understand that lungs basically in the chest cavity they are larger than their resting volume i will tell you later why but actually, if you bring my lungs out and put on my palms, they will become smaller. Why? I told you lungs have a lot of elastic tissue. And every elastic tissue tends to recoil at its neutral position. Is that right? If you bring the lungs out of my chest wall and outside they get smaller, it means that in the chest wall, they were not at their neutral position. They were in semi-extended position. Semi expanded position. Is that right? Opposed to that, if you bring my lungs out, you know that lungs will get smaller. But what will happen to my chest cage? Answer goes to this young lady. Listen carefully. We are trying to understand about volumes and capacity, but before I go into that detail, I want to come to a very basic concept of relationship between the lungs and the chest wall. One thing we have understood. Bring the lungs out, put it out, and they will immediately become smaller it means their resting elastic position is smaller and when they are present in my body they are actually in stretched position expanded position is it clear now my second question is that when you bring the lungs out we are leaving the chest wall behind what will happen to the chest wall it will move in or it will move out or it will remain at the same position if lungs are removed yes again listen it's a very important concept if you remove my lungs and put it outside and leave the chest wall behind. Now you have to answer 
that once the lungs have gone out, chest wall is left there, this chest wall will spring out or bulge in, go in or it will remain at the same position. Yes, ma'am. Answer is yes. Same position. Absolutely wrong answer. You have to remember, this is the point which I want to put at the first day or first moment of the lecture on lungs and pulmonary system. They bounce out. The very basic concept in relationship of chest wall and the lungs is that in neutral position, when I'm not breathing and I'm not doing any effort, right? My lungs are larger than their neutral elastic position. Chest wall is smaller than its neutral position. Why? Let me explain. Let me tell you. If I bring this lungs out, chest wall will become wider. So this is the chest wall. It will become wider. And if I bring the lungs out, lungs will become, yes, smaller or larger? They will become smaller. Look at it. It has become small and it has become small when it is out and as soon as they go out what will happen to chest it will go spring outward or inward outward so this is the very basic concept you have to understand that in a normal healthy person right what is really happening that lungs are normally expanded more than their neutral position and chest wall is normally pulled in this is the normal position is that right? Now what happens? Why it is so? Let me tell you why it is so. As you know, lungs have a lot of elastic tissue all the time. They are trying to go in. And chest wall has some rigidity and they try to maintain this outer position. But when lung and chest wall are sticky, lungs are trying to come in and chest wall is trying to go out, they achieve an equilibrium. They achieve an equilibrium. Is that right? Let me repeat it again. In a normal healthy person, right? After at the end of quiet expiration, when person is not doing any effort, not contracting any muscles related with the respiratory system, we say respiratory system. Respiratory system is at neutral position. But lungs are not at neutral. Chest wall is not at neutral. Whole respiratory system is neutral. But lungs are trying to collapse in. And chest wall is trying to spring out. Is that right? So it means when you will bring the lungs out, they will collapse in. And the chest wall which is left behind, it will spring out. But because when respiratory system is present in normal anatomical situation, and lungs and chest wall are attached with each other through the plural, sticky plural layers, then chest wall is trying to go out, lungs are trying to go in, but actually, they achieve an equilibrium. And that equilibrium, right, where you're not doing any effort, the volume of the lungs I've put here is this one. So what does it mean? That here is the volume of the lung. I'm putting it here. This is suppose your chest wall. These are the ribs. diaphragm. Now this is the volume where this is trying to go yes out and lungs are trying to pull yes trying the lungs are trying to pull in but the reality is this there is a pleural lining there is pleura around the lung yes what is this pleura called? visceral pleura right and there is pleural layer inside the chest wall and this is called which pleura yes parietal pleura and now normally this is look visceral pleura or inner pleura this is outer pleura or parietal pleura both of them are having very little fluid in and they are sticky with each other both these pleural layers are sticky to each other as you take two glass slide and you put the glass if you take two wet glass slide 
and you put them together, they become sticky or not? In the same way, these two layers of the pleura are sticky. And these two sticky layers of pleura, one is firmly attached with the lungs and other is firmly attached with the chest wall. They hold lungs and the chest wall together. Is that right? But in fact, in a living person, right now in Jew, lung is all the time trying to get smaller and chest wall is all the time trying to get spring out. But an equilibrium is achieved. When this equilibrium is achieved, is that right? We say this is a neutral position or equilibrium of respiratory system. When we say respiratory system, it means including the chest wall and the lungs. But it is not the neutral position of lungs, it is not the neutral position of chest wall. And a very important concept to make it this concept more clear is if you inject, if you put air here, if you put the air here, both layers will become separate. Then what will happen? Lungs will go in and chest wall will go out yes now you understand if you put the air in normally of course no air goes to the pleural cavity but if you suppose someone put a stab injury and air goes into this area and separate the visceral pleura and parietal pleura then lungs will collapse inward and chest wall will go outward am i clear now this is the position of the lungs at what moment when you are not doing any effort it means at the end of quiet expiration. Is that right? Now, if you are sitting comfortably and you are breathing quietly, is that right? Your normal regular breathing, not labored breathing as you do it in exercise, right? If you are breathing during this lecture or watching the video, of course you are breathing. But during that breathing, what is happening? During inspiration, you take a little inspiration, and during inspiration, what happened? Inspiratory muscle contract. During inspiration, inspiratory muscle contract and enlarge the chest wall. And when during inspiration, chest wall is pulled outward, what will happen to lungs? They will be also pulled outward. So lungs will become smaller or larger? Larger. And if you imagine, suppose this is the bronchial tree and this is the alveolar system. It's a very simple diagram. Now look, during inspiration, when this will enlarge, is that right? It will pull the lungs also outward. When lungs will be pulled outward, pressure in this area will go down and air will come in. And then this red volume will become more or less. You have to answer me. It will become more. So what we can say, this volume will become like this. Right? So let me put it here that suppose this was the original position. I am making it a smaller diagram. Just before inspiration, I have just made this diagram a little smaller. Suppose this is the new position when respiratory system is in equilibrium. The respiratory system is in equilibrium. If this is the position, when you do your normal inspiration, inspiratory muscle will expand the chest wall and little air will go in, we can say it becomes like this. Is that right? It becomes larger. So this is what happened during inspiration. Right? Now, what happens during expiration? Yes. During expiration, once you have done inspiration, air has come in. Now lungs volume has become less or more. During inspiration, lungs volume has become little more. Usually in quiet breathing, during inspiration, you have added about half liter of air in. How much air? Just half liter. Is that right? Now, once you have done inspiration, then what has to be done? Expiration? You have to get the air. So what will happen? During inspiration, during quiet, quiet inspiration, respiratory muscle contracted expanded the chest wall and that force pulled the lungs outward and air went in, right? During a normal expiration, which muscles contract? Uh, she says during expiration, normal expiration, which muscles contract? Yes, ma'am. During normal expiration, which muscle contract? No muscle contract. 
listen now very carefully it's a very basic concept during inspiration inspiratory muscle expanded the chest wall and lungs were forcefully expanded is that right but when lungs were forcefully expanded their power to recoil suppose this rubber was here and here now when you expand the rubber outward its power to recoil is more or less more so actually what happened during inspiration during before inspiration if lungs are at this position and once you have done inspiration your elastic lungs have been expanded and every child even knows that when elastic is stretched it loves to re recoil so what happens that once you have done normal inspiration right because lungs have been little bit more expanded they love to recoil so at the end of normal inspiration and at the beginning of expiration what do you do you just stop the activity in the inspiratory muscle just relax your which muscles inspiratory muscles and during quiet expiration lungs will pull the chest wall in and air will go out so what i'm trying to tell you i'm telling you in quiet breathing expiration is a passive process it does not require muscular effort during quiet inspiration muscle do expand the chest wall right but during quiet expiration what happens yes it is the passive phenomenon that expanded lungs require a little bit and pull the chest wall in once inspiratory muscles are relaxed pull the chest wall in and air goes out that's it is that right now so we can put it like this let's come back to the very basic that let's suppose this is the lung volume right there is equilibrium and then you start your quiet inspiration and what happens it becomes little large and what is this this is at quiet expiration it is at the quiet inspiration this phenomenon was done by inspiratory muscles but once inspiration has been done and the air which goes in we call it tidal volume the small amount of air which goes in what we call it tidal volume the amount of air which enters into lungs during quiet inspiration is called tidal volume but once tidal volume enters in inspiratory muscles relax and then lungs pull the chest wall back inward and same tidal volume which went in during inspiration will come out during expiration so what is tidal volume tidal volume is the volume of the air which moves in and out of the lungs during quiet inspiration and quiet expiration normally it is about half liter of 500 ml any question up to this right now look another situation let's suppose i make it here this is neutral position now i do quiet inspiration my lung goes to this situation is that right now let us suppose if i have done my quiet inspiration can i pull more air in yes right let me tell you this is my neutral position now i take tidal volume in right but if i want i can pull more air in but doing very extra effort of insp inspiration muscles inspiratory muscles if i do extra effort a lot of air has gone in but do you think normally i'm getting this extra air in no normally i'm not getting this extra air in normally i only move my lungs from this position to that position and back to this position but if i need to have extra air for example during heavy exercise then my inspiratory muscles can do some extra work and apply some extra force and enlarge the chest wall in an extra way so lungs will get extra air in so what we can say that once during quiet inspiration we have added the tidal volume to the lungs after that if you do special effort to bring as much air in as much you can do what will happen it will go up to that level 
Now this air which came in, this added volume, the volume which has been added, okay, I'll make it like this. This volume of the air which has been added to the lungs by an extra effort after the normal inspiration, after the quiet inspiration, this volume of the air is called inspiratory reserve volume. What is this? Inspiratory reserve volume. Inspiratory reserve volume. Right? And what was this? Yes, please. You are going to tell me. What is this? Tidal volume. Right? So, once you take the normal tidal volume in, then you draw as hard as you can to bring extra air in. What you are drawing in? Inspiratory reserve volume. Is that clear? Any question up to this? Again. So, inspiratory reserve volume is what? That after from equilibrium position, if you have taken normal inspiration and after that whatever extra you draw in that is you can draw in that is inspiratory reserve volume. Now let's suppose after that you bring your breathing at normal pattern. If I bring my breathing normal pattern it means I get rid of inspiratory reserve volume and I start breathing in between these two positions. Right? And Right now I'm breathing in a normal fashion, so it means that I'm moving just tidal volume in and tidal volume out, right? But I can do another thing. What is that? That after bringing the normal air out, after bringing the tidal volume out, after quiet expiration, with special expiratory muscle effort, I can squeeze the chest wall and bring extra air out. For example. This is I'm taking normal inspiration expiration. Now I'm going to get extra air out. What I've thrown out. Normally I don't throw this extra air out. This is expiration which was in reserve. So what will be this extra volume I've thrown out? Expiratory reserve volume. So what we can do now when I was breathing at the normal situation. Right? This is what was going on. Right? And after achieving up to here, right, I did an extra effort to push more air out and another volume of the air went out. And this volume of the air which went out, what is this volume? This is, what is this? Yes, please. Expiratory. Yes, you have to help me during this lecture. It's very easy. Expiratory reserve volume. Am I clear? Any question up to this? So normally we are moving at this situation. Right? But if you pull extra air in, you are actually getting what air in? Inspiratory reserve volume. And again you are breathing normal. But if you get the extra air out by squeezing too much, right? What you are pushing out? Expiratory reserve volume. But do you think with all your effort, can you bring all the air out of lungs? Can you do that? At least not from your own lungs. Maybe with some special effort on someone else's lungs you can do. But with your own lungs, with all your expiratory effort, you can still cannot empty the lungs completely. Why? Because chest wall cannot collapse. Expiratory muscle try to bring the chest wall inward. But there is a limit. Chest wall cannot completely collapse. And thank God. Because chest wall cannot completely collapse so lungs don't collapse totally right so what happens that when you are bringing the chest wall in by special expiratory effort which is releasing expiratory reserve volume look at me what I'm going to do I'm going to bring out expiratory reserve volume first I breathe normally now yes but I cannot take it more in I cannot take it in because my muscles cannot squeeze my chest wall in. It means there is always some air left in the lungs, right, which you can never get out in physiological conditions. Of course, if you move tank over me, that will go out hopefully. But in physiological conditions, that part of the air which cannot, you cannot get out of the lungs, we call it residual volume. 
This is the residue which remains there. What is this called? Residual volume. So look here. This is the air which you can never get out during physiological. What is this air called? Residual volume. Is that right? Any question here? Now, I'm going to take a little test of you. I will see have you understood these volumes or not. I will make the spirogram later. Yes, normally it is moving like this. Right? What is this? This is after quite expiration and this is after quite inspiration. And what is in between? Tidal volume. Tidal volume in, tidal volume out. Is that right? Then, if I bring extra air in, if I bring extra air in, now what is this volume which has been added to the lungs? Inspiratory reserve volume. And again if I get the inspiratory reserve volume out, which was added after addition of the tidal volume. If we get this out and start breathing it normal tidal volume in and out, and then if you command me that I should breathe out as hard as I can, I can get some extra air out and that extra air which can go out, right, this air. What is this air now? Yes, expiratory reserve volume, right. And the last part of the air which I cannot get out of my lungs in spite of trying very hard, what is this? Residual volume. Any question up to this? Why is it so important to understand these volumes? Because in certain different diseases, these volumes change. Is that right? Now one question is there. What is the use of residual volume? Yes. Why residual volume should be there? It's very important to have residual volume. Do you know why? Let me tell you before you tell me something new. Actually, lungs are having, you know, lot of alveoli and alveoli are wet surfaces. It's a very simple diagram. If lungs completely collapse, then alveolar walls will become sticky with each other. What happens if lungs completely collapse and all the air go out, if, right? Hypothetically, if there is no residual volume and you can push all the air out, you will be in a big trouble. You know why? Because when lungs will collapse, alveolar walls and smaller airways will collapse. When they will collapse, they are wet inside and they will stick with each other as wet slides. And, and do you think it is easy to inflate it again? No. So thank God there is residual volume which prevents the total collapse of air spaces because if there was no residual volume and if air spaces collapse totally the walls will stick with each other as they are wet and there will be very high surface tension and then to reinflate the lungs or to re-expand the these sticky lungs we have law we need a lot of effort is that right so this is main for one purpose of the residual what volume any question up to this? It's easy, isn't it? Okay. Now, there's another thing. Sometimes, some combinations are discussed. What are those combinations? Combinations of the volumes. For example, as I told you previously, a normal person who is watching this video or studying this lecture is breathing at these two positions. These two positions. Tidal volume in, tidal volume out. And this volume is left inside the lungs all the time. But this volume which is left inside the lungs, it consists of two parts. One part is residual volume and other part is, what is this part? Yes, expiratory reserve volume. Is that right? Now, listen very carefully. I'm saying normally our lungs during inspiration from this point to go to this point. And during expression, they come back to this. So when normally you are having quiet breathing, tidal volume is moving in, out, in, out like this. Right? So it means this amount of air is not going out normally. 
right now this amount of the air which is not going out it is sum of the two volumes one volume is which one yes expiratory reserve volume another is residual volume now if you add what is this expiratory reserve volume plus residual volume both of them make this volume together is that right now this volume together right volume number one which is residual volume number two is expiratory reserve volume one plus two is the volume volume on which we are working our title volume one plus two is actually called a capacity actually whenever two or more than two volumes are added together they are termed as capacity so one plus two is called functional residual volume what is it functional residual volume true true residual volume is volume number one which you can never get out of lungs in physiological circumstances is that right but in normally lungs are operating at a residual volume which is true residual volume plus expiratory reserve volume and because lungs are normally operating at this situation now i'll put it like this and this volume consists of which two volumes residual volume and expiratory reserve volume both of them together they are called functional residual capacity functional residual capacity but true residual capacity is this one right but truly we are functioning over this question is that what is the advantage of having functional residual capacity why this much air is when you are quietly breathing why these two volumes are always retained in the lungs only third volume is added and removed tidal volume normally when you are quite breathing volume number one and two right which are residual volume and expiratory reserve volume together which make functional residual capacity right actually in normal quiet breathing we are adding the tidal volume in and out over the what is this functional residual capacity question is that why nature has this thing there the multiple purposes anyone who can answer you have taken the lecture today you know the advantage of why there should be true residual volume because we don't want lungs to collapse is that right what is the purpose of these two yes this very good number one he is saying that for example when you are getting that tidal volume out still some air is there which can allow some gas exchange with the blood because blood is passing through that right and this is a very important concept that blood is passing through the lungs almost continuously but breathing is episodic is that right if lungs really completely co collapse in between the breathing then blood cannot pass there is another advantage thank god lungs don't collapse totally do you agree with me sure okay secondly secondly another important point is that this functional residual volume these two volumes because they are all the time there during quiet breathing so even when you are taking the air out during expiration still some air is there and this air help in gas exchange still with the blood that oxygen will keep on loading to the blood carbon dioxide will keep on coming from the blood to the alveolar space am i clear what is the purpose of these two spaces still they allow the gas exchange when tidal volume is going out another advantage tidal volume is half liter tidal volume is how much 500 ml or half liter right this is about one and a half liter approximately and this is also approximately one and a half liter approximately it varies from person to person uh, sometimes they say it is 1.1 liter and it is 1.4 liter but let's make it 1.5 liter and 1.5 liter for our easy concept now it means residual volume is one and a half liter expiratory reserve volume is one and a half liter so functional residual capacity is oh your math is very good 3 liter press now listen this 3 liter air is always in the lung what you are doing during inspiration you add half liter to so make 3 liter 3 and a half liter during expiration 
you remove half liter and convert in half liter into three liter. Is that clear? Now, points here. You know, when new air goes in, it is having more oxygen and less carbon dioxide. Is that true? When you do inspiration, this tidal volume, when it comes in, thank God that when we take half liter of air in, when it goes in, it about 350 ml of that mixes with functional residual capacity. So what does it mean? That fresh air which goes in, it mixes with functional residual capacity and does not produce very drastic fluctuation in the gas composition in the alveoli. Do you get it or not? For example, if these two volumes are not there, when the fresh air comes, oxygen tension suddenly goes very high. Is that right? Carbon dioxide is very low in alveoli. Right? And then all the air come out, situation will be different. But thank God that this functional residual capacity to which we add or remove the tidal volume. And this half liter of tidal volume which is added and removed to 3 liter of the air that does not produce very severe fluctuations in alveolar gas composition. Am I clear or I am teaching myself? You are understanding that, right? There is purpose of understanding these volumes and capacities. Now, what did we say? That when volume number 1, okay, I will put all the volumes again on the side as 1, 2, 3 and then we will derive the capacities. And then we'll make the spirogram. Yes, I'm putting this which you can never get out. What is it? You can never get out. Residual volume. Then there is something you can only get out with special effort. What is it? Expiratory reserve volume. And then at the top of these two, what you can add? Yes, tidal volume and if you do some very extra effort some very beautiful girl asked to take as deep breathing as possible just to see what is your lung situation are you healthy enough or not for some things what is this yes inspiratory reserve volume is that right so these are the four volumes let's call them volume number one is residual volume volume number two is yes Expiratory is the volume, but normally we are moving volume number 3 which is tidal volume and when we are doing some exercise we can add respiratory reserve volume. These are four volumes. Let me put the values also there. Uh, residual volume is approximately how much? About 1.5 liter. Expiratory reserve volume is also about 1.5 liter. This is about 0.5 liter and look. 1.5 and 1.5 and one and is equal to 3 and this half should have 2.5 to again making 3. Is that right? Volume 1 and 2 together make 3 liter. Volume 3 and 4 together make 3 liter. Is that right? And if I say you add all the volumes 1, 2, 3, 4. Tell me rapidly how many liter here? 6 liter. That is the total lung capacity. Total lung capacity is? The maximum volume of the air which can be pulled in the lungs with all your inspiratory effort. Is that right? Now, let's start discussing few things. If I make it like this, now you will tell me these two volumes, if volume number one plus volume number two are added together. What is this capacity now? What is this capacity? This is residual volume plus what is this? Expiratory reserve volume together they are functional residual capacity. This is functional residual capacity, the lungs which is shown over here, right? Now, let me show you another thing and that is about Yes, these two added together. Let's suppose you have functional residual capacity already. Let me put it here that here is we are having functional residual capacity, right? 1 plus 2. Now, if you add to this a little bit, what is this? 
tidal volume, normal tidal volume, plus you add to it what? What is this? Inspiratory reserve volume. So you have added 3 and 4. Now 1, 2, 3, 4 together are what? Total lung capacity. So we can say total lung capacity is sum of all these. Residual volume plus expiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume. Do you think it's difficult to understand? It's so easy. Is that right? Now I asked you a question. Listen very carefully. This is the red, red volume which is normally moving in and out. Is that right? This is the red volume. You move the air in, you move the air out, right? You are moving between these two points, this and this. Is that right? Now I am going to ask you a question. Let us suppose you are under extreme physical labor and exercise or maybe some black big dog is after you and you are running rather flying. Then you are breathing a lot. Is that right? In that situation, of course you will not take little air in, you will take a lot of air in. So you will invade the inspiratory reserve volume and then what you will do? When you will bring the air out, maybe you will squeeze it more and more air out to get more ventilation. It's someone else. So it means you will invade in expiratory reserve volume. So it means under extreme circumstances, you can do maximum inspiration up to this point and you can do maximum, okay, look, expiration up to this point. Is that right? You cannot take inspiration more than this. You cannot bring the lungs volume less than this. Am I clear to all of you? So actually this if volume number 2, 3 and 4 are added, volume number 2, 3 and 4 are added, this is telling the range of a person in which he can do maximum air he can add and remove from his lungs because this is something he cannot add and he cannot remove. Once it is there, it is there residual volume. Is that right? Now, let me give you an example. Let us suppose if I do my maximum effort of inspiration, attention please, look at me. If I do maximum inspiration, yeah, now bring this out, now bring this out, I bring it here. Can I bring it down further? No. Now, how all these things are my capacity of the lung to maximum capacity of the lung to move the air out and in. This is very important capacity. You know the real thing the lungs can do, how much maximum air they can take in and bring out. This is actually normal air taken in and out, tidal volume during quiet breathing. But if you take air from here up to here, it means after taking the full inspiration, how much maximum you can bring expiration. And after bringing all the expiration, how much maximum you can go for inspiration. This is very, very important concept because this tells how much functional capacity of the lungs is there. Is that right? This is vital for the lungs. So what we call these three capacities together, volumes together, vital capacity. What is this? Vital capacity. So these three together, they are called vital capacity. Vital capacity is the concept of that we are not now talking about normal tidal volume. We are truly talking about the maximum possible tidal volume. Maximum possible tidal volume is take from here up to here. Right? Normal tidal volume is bringing half liter in, half liter out. But maximum tidal volume is what from here up to there. What is this? How much? One and a half liter, half liter. How much it becomes? Two liter and two and a half liter is four and a half. Again, let me tell you. This is one and a half liter, right? What is this? One and a half liter. What is this? Half liter. And what is this? 2.5 liter. Is that right? Now listen. This you cannot get in or out. Thank God. 
right now we can deal this under extreme circumstances one girl may ask you to get the maximum air in you go to the total lung capacity and then just to make fun of you say bring the maximum air out and you bring only air out and you can come up to here is that right so under these circumstances this is your vital capacity is that right now this vital capacity is the sum of three volumes what are these three volumes yes expiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume now it is one and a half liter plus half liter two liter plus two and a half liter four and a half liter so what does it mean total capacity is six liter if a person has total capacity of a lung because total capacity of the lung varies from person to person the people who are very tall will have more capacity right the people who are very male actually all the male have more capacity than volumes and females are little less uh, capacity than volumes right anyway so what i'm talking about that if your total lung capacity is 6 liter and one and a half liter is residual volume which is not modifiable then what is vital capacity four and a half liter is that right four and a half liter is the capacity of the lung which is vital for the lung under extreme circumstances when you want to make the maximum air in and maximum air out any question up to this anyone who is confused so you understand what is vital capacities how many capacities do you have another thing now i will first put normal breathing pattern it's just a little test of you normal breathing pattern this is what tidal volume right normally lung is moving in and out but these how many volumes are here yes residual volume plus expiratory reserve volume and both of them together are called functional residual capacity right so from here up to here residual volume up to here from here what is this functional residual capacity is that right then tidal volume is added here what is this added tidal volume here and then over that yes what you are going to add inspiratory reserve volume is that right what is added here inspiratory reserve volume but from here okay from the base up to this what is this yes total lung capacities when volumes are added they are called capacities so when volume number one and two is added what is this functional residual capacity when all the volumes are added what is this total lung capacity but the air which can be really moved in and out is volume number two three and four and this air we can never get out is that right so these three together are called vital capacity is that right now another thing normally you're moving at the residual functional residual volume this is up to here and tidal volume is coming in and out but if you do some extra effort you can do extra inspiration now these together from here quiet inspiration and then additional inspiration this together total is called then i mean like this 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 plus additional inspiration all this together what is three and four is called inspiratory capacity what is this this and this inspiratory capacity because lungs and respiratory system is neutral at this position it is quite inspiration this is effortful maximum inspiration both of them together can be called inspiratory capacity inspiratory capacity is how much half liter and two and a half liter approximately three liters any question up to this so these volumes and capacities are clear there's no problem now now most of these volumes and capacities they can be determined by a special instrument called spirogram right and that method by which we determine the volumes and capacity right we call it spirometry the only thing is that residual volume cannot be determined directly by spirometer because what happens when air goes out into spirometer and comes back we can measure 
But because this air never goes into spirometer and does not come back, can spirometer measure this residual volume? No. So the volume which cannot be measured by spirometer is residual volume because spirometer measures the air which goes from the lungs to the spirometer or from the spirometer the air which goes to the lungs because residual volume stay stays always into lung. So residual volume cannot be measured directly by the spirometry. For that we use a special method I will tell you later. Now let's come back and talk about spirometer. No problem with the volumes and capacities. Now spirometer is a very simple instrument which help us to get baseline you can say readings about the lung volume then capacity. Let us suppose that here is your lung right and here you are with your beautiful eyes and I make it a very simple diagram and a tube from your mouth is going to the spirometer. Spirometer is basically having two drums. There's one drum like this. Right, it is full of water. It is full of water. And over it, there is an inverted drum which is full of air. This is air. Is that right? There is water and there is air and this air drum at the top through a pulley, there are two pulleys, it is added to a pointer. Let us suppose there is a pen with a little ink here. It is a pen. Now let us suppose here is a paper moving. paper roll moving here. Now this is paper roll and paper roll is moving, right? Now you imagine, okay, I will make it different color. This is the pen with little ink here. Now listen, if this person is not breathing, it means no air going in and out. If he hold his breathing, as paper keep on moving, it will make a straight line. Is that right? But normally a healthy person is breathing. So, if this person is breathing what? Normal breathing, right? Quiet breathing, easy breathing. If he is breathing in easy way or quiet inspiration and expiration, what happens? Initially, during quiet breathing, this is the initial point from where paper is moving and we have put the pen over here. As he does his normal inspiration, as he will do a normal inspiration, air will go here. How much air will go in? Tidal volume, normal inspiration, quiet inspiration, how much air will go in? Half liter, half liter will go in. When this air will go in, then this drum will come down and it will move up. Are you understanding? This is very simple mechanic. That when this person will do inspiration, air with a half liter of the air pulled in, when air pulled in, this drum will go down and this will pull all these things upward. So what will happen? This will move upward. Normal inspiration is done. Now normal quiet expiration. Now what happened? That basically it moved from here to here. Is that right? Now he does expiration. When he is doing expiration, he is blowing the air out. Normal amount of air out. During quiet breathing. Normal expiration. When he is doing normal expiration, uh, half liter air is added here now and drum goes a little up, right? And when drum will go up, this will come a little down. So what really happens during normal quiet breathing, you move up and down, up and down, up and down. So what is this? This is normal inspiration, quiet inspiration, quiet expiration. Quiet inspiration, expiration, quiet inspiration, expiration, right? And this is half liter air added, half liter air went out, so and so forth. Tidal volume added, tidal volume removed. Am I clear? Any problem up to this? Now, I told you there was a beautiful girl who asked you to take the maximum air in and just show. Uh, just to, to make fun of you or maybe she wants to assess something. She wants to see how much your lungs can maximum expand. Right? Now what do you do? 
you want to show you can pull lot of air in what you will add now you will not only pull the tidal volume in you will also pull the inspiratory reserve volume so tidal volume will go in then inspiratory reserve volume will go in lot of air will go to the lungs lungs will go to that situation you remember when lungs have gone to that situation air has moved into this direction it will become significantly down and will pull the string and when pull string will be pulled here it will move upward and we say with on maximum what is this inspiratory i told you this topic is so easy it should not be taught this is normal lung situation you remember that the original discussion we started lung situation like this and lung situation like this wall right <coughs> now this is the specially added maximum what you could add you come to the normal breathing pattern after that and then again she is still naughty and now she asks show me how much maximum air you can get out after normal air getting out and now again you are fooled and you try to <sighs> maximum air out and you go up to this and then again you start normal now look when she asked you to take the maximum you went up to here what was this it was tidal volume moving in then inspiratory reserve volume also so truly residual volume residual volume was already there what is this expiratory reserve volume normally you are just adding tidal volume in and out but here residual volume plus what was it expiratory reserve volume both of them were what which capacity functional residual capacity and now first you have just completed your tidal volume in and then she asked you to take what in yes expiratory inspiratory reserve volume and she has asked you take your lungs up to the total lung capacity is that right and when you have added these two together what you have added inspiratory capacity this is inspiratory reserve volume is there but tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume together they are called inspiratory capacity is that right so after the uh, functional residual capacity this is inspiratory capacity total first tidal volume normally plus this added any question up to this right then she asked you to get the after normal quiet expiration how much maximum you can blow out and what you are showing now oh my god it should not go residual volume out even the no beautiful girl can get this out from your lungs so what is this residual volume will stay in and what you got out here expiratory reserve volume any question up to this then suddenly she want to assess your lungs whole performance she says take the maximum breath in as much you can do and then blow out all the air which you can bring out so what happens if you really obey her it depends on your state of mind right now you bring first tidal volume in then you take the inspiratory reserve volume is that right now she says blow out whatever you can blow out from your respiratory system so what you do first you will blow out inspiratory what reserve volume then you will blow out tidal volume and then you will hopefully blow out expiratory reserve volume but you will say you cannot get the residual volume out now all this the after taking maximum inspiration the maximum air you can bring out what is that vital capacity is that right or we can say also like this that first this is one way to present another after normal breathing she says first get maximum air out right then you pull in as much air as much you can again that is also vital capacity is that right any question up to this there is no question okay so let's check how much you remember understood out of this topic it's a spirogram so tidal volume in out and what is this going in now from here to here yes inspiratory yeah inspiratory reserve volume and then again coming normal and what is this went out 
expiratory reserve volume and now we are moving like this right and you take the maximum breath in and then bring the maximum air out and again normal what is this vital capacity now talk about let's suppose capacities here this is the air which you cannot get out what is this what is this volume residual volume uh, up to here what is it expiratory reserve volume and both of them together what is this okay I will change the color both of these together what is it functional residual capacity very good but if you take it from here from here up to there what is it vital capacity it includes expiratory reserve volume tidal volume inspiratory reserve volume is that right no problem here now spirometer can tell you what is the tidal volume from the here is the time and here is the volume so we are actually in the spirometer uh, what we are doing that in the spirography or spirogram we are keep uh, drawing the volume against time right this is the time and this is the volume now you can determine the tidal volume you can determine the expiratory reserve volume you can determine the sorry inspiratory reserve volume expiratory reserve volumes but there are few things you cannot determine by spirogram this residual volume can you determine by the spirogram no so because residual volume cannot be determined directly by the spirogram so can spirogram tell you functional residual capacity no because functional residual capacity has two component one is residual volume other is expiratory reserve volume spirogram can tell you expiratory reserve volume but cannot tell you residual volume so we can say there is one volume which cannot be measured by direct spiro metry what is that volume residual volume and there's one capacity which cannot be measured directly by the spirometry what is that capacity sum of one and two what is that functional residual capacity for to determine this residual volume or functional residual capacity we use a special method which is indirect use of spirometry we call it helium dilution method so let me explain that how we can determine because residual volume never goes out of the lung right so we cannot directly measure by these fluctuations right so how we can determine by helium dilution method principle is very simple first i will tell you the principle and then we will move ahead let us suppose this is a tube system any system a and here is let's suppose system b in the system A, you add a gas. Let's suppose you add helium. What are you adding? Helium. Usually we use helium gas because it does not absorb into blood. So it remains. Now, here is a valve. Now, if you know, I will tell you the, first of all the very basic principle. It's so easy to understand. Let us suppose this is system A of the gas. Is that right? And this system has, suppose, 10% helium 10% helium and let's suppose that this total air is one and a half liter this is spirometer in the spirometer there is suppose one and a half liter of what helium is that right sorry one and a half liter of air one and a half liter of air with how much concentration of helium 10% is that right but let us suppose we don't know what is this volume b volume how we can indirectly estimate the b volume is remove this valve and person let the person breathe in and out so what will happen that helium will which was originally in system a will also move to the system b and then it will get concentrated here or diluted here diluted here now let us suppose if this volume is very small there will be little dilution here but if this volume is unknown volume is very big it will be very much diluted here it means by the degree 
degree of dilution of helium concentration in the spirometry, we can estimate the volume of given unknown volume of the lung. Am I clear? Are you understanding me? Yes, ma'am? No problem. So again, let me repeat it. It's so easy to understand. We cannot get this volume out. Let us suppose one and a half liter of air in spirometer, one and a half liter of air in spirometer having helium 10%. Is that right? And we ask the person to breathe out as hard as he can. What will be left here? Residual volume. Then you open the clamp and ask the person to breathe in out. So what was here left? Residual volume. Let the one and a half liter air of the helium with 10, sorry, one and a half liter of air of spirometer volume with 10 percent of helium, let it equilibrate with the, what is this? Which volume? Residual volume. After little time, you will find helium concentration here has gone up or down? Down. down right? Now, let us suppose original helium concentration first just do it intuitively. Don't try to be mathematician. First, initially it was 10% helium here, right? After all this thing, when you again measure helium is 5%. What do you think? What could be the volume here? Listen. Helium was 10% in one and a half liter of spirometer volume. Is that right? One spirometer volume equilibrated with the which volume? Residual volume. After that, concentration of helium diluted from 10% to 5%. What could be the, this uh, volume here? It should be one and a half liter. Oh my God, your math is really like mine. <laughs> Look, it's so simple. This is container number one, this is container number two. Here it's one and a half liter of air with 10% helium. In container number two, we don't know what is the volume of air. We mix the things. Right? Gas equilibrate on both sides. Helium was originally here, how much? 10%. After equilibration, it is 5%. So this air has been mixed with how much air in this area? One and a half. Both were equal. You are understanding me? Or still not understood? You couldn't, no problem. I will make it more simple. You just imagine about water. You have water in this container. 10% sugar in it, very sweet. Is that right? And you connect it with another container, suppose, which is having also water, but no sugar in it. Right? And opening the valve, you mix it for some time. Is that right? And then sugar in this container from 10% goes to 5%. What do you think? How much was this? If this was one liter, it was also one liter. Is that right? Another thing, it's so easy intuitively. If it is one liter air here in the spirometer and 10% helium, after equilibrating, it is 5% here. What was this volume? One liter. But let us suppose this was one liter air with 10% helium in the spirometer volume. After equilibrating, rather than 10%, it is only 1%. So it means this volume is about nine times more than this. You get it now? Or another way, it is one, uh, one liter air in spirometer and here is, we don't know how much in the lungs, but when we equilibrate, 10% dilution drop to 9%. So it means it's very large or very small? Very small. It's so simple. Is it difficult? So it's so simple that helium gets diluted when from a known volume, this is a known volume and known concentration of helium, mixed with unknown volume. But after dilution, we know the final concentration. We can determine the uh, volume of this area. So simple equation is, this is spirometer volume, volume of the spirometer into, what was this? Concentration of helium, which concentration? Initial concentration of helium. Let's suppose concentration of helium, I put it here. These two is equal, should be equal to unknown volume, unknown volume into final concentration. Are you understanding? Unknown volume plus what other volume is with it? 
This is the total volume into final concentration. This is the original volume with the original concentration. This is the basic equation. Now, what we re really wanted to know, unknown volume, which was residual volume. If you work out this equation, that all these things go to the other side, it should become unknown volume is what? Residual volume or lung volume, whatever it is, residual or whatever. So lung volume can be equal to, if you solve this equation, spirometry volume, spirometry volume into now initial concentration minus final concentration divided by final concentration. Right? If you cannot understand all this thing, it's still so simple. That when a known volume with known concentration is equilibrated with unknown volume, is the right degree of dilution can tell you what was the unknown volume. Any question here? You look very serious. You understand it? Yes. No problem? It's getting but slowly. I think you're sitting at a distance. Okay, let me explain. There's one thing very simple that as I told you, let's go with the example of sugar. Right? One liter of water with 10% sugar. Very, very sugary. Is that right? Unknown volume. When we open the valve and mix them, right? What will happen? Sugar concentration will equilibrate on both sides. We have not added or removed the sugar from the system. But from system one, it has gone to the system two. Is that right? Now in the end, we will have the final concentration of sugar multiplied by volume one plus volume two. Initial volume and unknown volume. Is that right? Now listen. Sugar did not add to the system. So originally, known volume, known volume was parameter volume. Known volume into sugar concentration. Initial sugar concentration gives you figure. Is that right? Now, when you mix it with the, what was other? Unknown volume. It will get diluted. What should be the result? That initial figure should be equal to the final figure. Initial figure was initial volume of spirometry with the 10% sugar. And final figure was volume of initial volume plus final volume into dropped concentration. Is that right? Now, let's make it with the example. I told you there is one and a half liter air here. How much is here? One and a half liter. And how much it is? 10%. Is that right? Helium. This is initial. Spirometer one and a half liter into what is this? 10%. Is that right? Now, after equilibrating, this concentration became how much? 5%. Is that right? But 5% is multiplied by unknown plus this one. Right? If you resolve this equation, it should come up that unknown volume can be determined, this unknown variable can be determined, right? By multiplying the known volume, which was this. Initial concentration was 10. What was this? 10 minus 5. Is that right? What was this here? Also 5. And what was this? One and a half. Is that right? So if you solve it, you will get this thing out. Am I clear? Now how you will get it out? Listen. 10 minus 5 is equal to 5. 5 by 5 is equal to 1. 1 into 1 and a half is equal to 1 and a half. So what was unknown volume? We don't need to call Arshamidas to understand it. Right? Still my friend, you are confused or clear? Now you are really clear. Thank you for knowing it. Okay, let's go to the some pathological situations. Yes, effects of aging on lung volumes. As you become more and more senior, what happens to your lungs volume? Yes, anyone who will tell me. Elasticity. Yes, very good. He knows with aging, elasticity decreases. Ask any woman. Skin elasticity decreases. Not only skin elasticity decreases, even lungs elasticity also decreases. Now it's very easy to understand. If your lungs with the age become less elastic, then the residual volume will become less or more? That will be more, yes. You know, it is like a good elastic. If you use good elastic for long, 60 years, 
Usually no one uses one elastic for 60 years. But if you use one elastic for 60 years, it will become tight or loose? Loose. So lungs become loose? All the day I don't, how many times you are stretching and not stretching. So when lungs elasticity become loose, they don't pull the chest wall too much in. Right? So they, they, their tendency to collapse is more or less. Loose elastic has more tendency to recoil or less tendency to recoil? Less. So that will become a loose elastic is a little longer elastic. Everyone knows that. In the same way, loose lungs are little bigger lungs. So, so these bigger lungs, you cannot get the maximum air out. So with the aging, as elasticity becomes less, your residual volume becomes more. Is that right? And later on I will explain, when elasticity becomes less, then airways become little narrow. And that also adds to the increased residual volume. But with the age, total lung capacity does not change. With the aging, now you see, we go to this diagram, our original diagram. Now you will tell me, volume number one was what? Residual. Two was what? Expiratory reserve volume. Three was what? Tidal volume and fourth was this. Is that right? Now as your age increases, total lung capacity really does not change much. It stays there. Maximum you can take up to that. But this thing, it moves upward. So what decreases here? Vital capacity, very good. Because volume 2, 3 and 4 was what? Vital capacity. Look, what vital capacity? After taking the maximum inspiration, what is the amount of air you can maximally blow out? That is these three. Or after taking maximum expiration, how much air you can inspire in? So what happens with aging? especially after 60, right, what happens? Residual volume increases pathologically uh, slightly more, but because there's no significant increase in total lung capacity, but there's increase in vital, uh, residual volume. So what reduces? Vital capacity. Is that right? But from age zero after the birth up to the 20, the volumes are progressively increasing, right? And between 20 to 60, they are almost stable, right? If you are not suffering with any disease. Now we come to some pathological conditions which affect the vital capacity. One of the most important capacity is which capacity? Now I want to also tell you something. When we talk about helium dilution method, you understand the basic concept of helium? Dilution method. Just I want to add one more concept to that. In helium dilution method, what was happening? There was spirometer and you are having a tube here going to the person. Suppose it is going to the this beautiful mouth, great nose, beautiful eyes and respiratory system and lungs are attached. Okay. One thing which I want to mention, helium was here, right? Now listen very carefully. If I ask this person to bring the maximum air out, the maximum he can bring, and after that I open the valve and let him breathe into this, then spirometric volume is mixing with which volume here? Residual volume, is that right? But if I ask the person that don't bring the maximum air out, no. Just breathe normally and then bring the normal expiration out. That is just bring the tidal volume out. What is left behind? Oh. Residual volume plus expiratory reserve volume. What are those two volume one and two? Functional what? Functional, Functional residual volume. So if, he, if I ask my patient to just bring the tidal volume out normal and then start breathing into this system, what we will determine? Functional residual volume. But if I ask the person to bring the maximum air out and then connect the system one to two, then what I am determining? Residual volume, right? So we can say helium dilution method can be used to determine the residual volume directly or it can be determined to measure the functional residual capacity. Am I clear? But once you determine the functional residual capacity, functional residual capacity and if you know 
what is the expiratory reserve volume which can be measured very easily by spirometer you can determine the residual volume one way to determine the residual volume is what determine the functional residual capacity by helium dilution minus what expiratory reserve volume any question here anyone who is still confused last not here claro okay after this now let's go to the concept of vital capacity in pathological conditions and physiological conditions as i told you vital capacity is a very important parameter vital capacity tells you that after maximum inspiration what is the maximum amount of air you can bring out or after maximum expiration what is the maximum amount of air you can take in that is vital capacity now vital capacity is normally physiologically more in males right why males have more uh, vital capacity they have to run after females or what or maybe females have less vital capacity so that they don't really run away okay the main reason is that because uh, males have been physically more active evolutionary right so their inspiratory muscles are stronger their chest wall is larger in size right and of course lungs are also slightly larger all of that contribute to the what their increased vital capacity so male as a gender they have more vital capacity even though do you may come across a small male also then uh, athletic people who train themselves they are also vital capacity is more than do you think athletes are abnormal he say that athletes have more vital capacity as compared to the normal people not normal athletes are also normal i should say uh, regular people or non athletic personalities right so because it's, it's athletes number one because uh, you know especially who are doing cardio respiratory exercises their muscles become stronger in respiratory and expiratory plus their lungs and airways also respond better then third thing is that body size it's very easy to understand the people who are very tall and very broad i think right i will not use the other word right they have also better vital capacity but not the obese people that if you are very obese diaphragm cannot go down can you have a good vital capacity if you are very obese you try to bring the maximum air in maybe air does not go in but all the things come out <laughs> you understand it so if you are tall you're slender you're broad chested you're more and male you have more vital capacity if you're female if you're not athletic if you're pregnant or obesity your vital capacity will be down am i clear okay now we come to the pathological conditions which reduce the vital capacity again vital capacity is the maximum tidal volume not regular tidal volume vital capacity can also be imagined as the maximum tidal volume the maximum air which can come in or come go out now let's talk about pathological conditions which can reduce vital capacity vital capacity depends on what factors number one it depends on lungs of course right and it also depends on the airways if airways are not working do you think you can get the air in or out uh, it's a very simple diagram and then what are these things muscles and ribs right here is your diaphragm it's not anatomical diagram just for a basic concept so chest wall with lungs and airways right and of course you do have a central nervous system am i right which control the respiratory apparatus especially there are inspiratory centers here and then the from here fibers come down and phrenic nerve come out from here phrenic nerve what is the root value of phrenic nerve very good 3 4 5 what lumbar cervical <laughs> so always tell completely 3 4 5 cervical right of course it goes and supplies the innervation to the diaphragm plus there are other intercostal muscles um, intercostal nerves which also supply these muscles is that right now this is basic operators 
which determines the vital capacity. Let me tell you, start the problems here. If the problem is the central nervous system, let's suppose these motor neurons are damaged, right? Especially in poliomyelitis. Poliomyelitis. What do you think? If these neurons are not firing, can you move the diaphragm well and can you uh, do inspiratory and expiratory muscle movement? No. So vital capacity will become more or less? Less. Is that right? So neuromuscular operators. Then if someone has central nervous system and peripheral nerves, okay. But these muscles are problem. For example, there is uh, myopathies. There are certain inherited disorders in which muscles are very weak. And if they are myopathies, can you pull a lot of air in and push a lot of air out? No, so vital capacity will become less. So in poliomyelitis, in myopathies, then in myasthenia gravis, myopathies, then there is a disease called, this is also a disease of mus neuromuscular junction, myasthenia gravis. In myasthenia gravis, what happened? That at neuromuscular junction, I suppose synaptic membrane, what is happening? Antibodies are blocking the receptors. which receptors? Receptors. Cholinergic nicotinic receptors. Very good. Right? So neuromuscular transmission is impaired and muscles don't contract well. So you just imagine either there's a problem what? In medulla or problem into motor neurons or there's demyelinating diseases of nerves or at neuromuscular junction or with the muscle. All these problems can lead to reduced vital capacity. Is it difficult to comprehend this thing? Simply neuromuscular system is not working well for the chest wall. Secondly, another, if the chest wall itself is not okay, let's suppose vertebral column is, you know this vertebral column is here usually, this vertebral column is have some abnormal bend. If it is bended on the sides, scoliosis, or anteroposteriorly if it is if normally bend, we call it kyphosis. If person has kyphosis or scoliosis, let's suppose I have a problem like this. Do you think I can breathe in well or out? So what will happen to my vital capacity? Yeah. Down. So vital capacity can be reduced in neuromuscular diseases, can be reduced in... Of course, neuromuscular include the myopathy, muscle myopathy, right? Also related with the rib cage or the spine because when spine is kyphosis or scoliosis then ribs cannot be angulated well and cannot work well am i clear then okay let's suppose neuro nervous system is okay muscles are okay these uh, ribs and the spine is perfectly okay the next problem can be problem within the lung substance let's suppose if there is fibrosis in the lung lungs become scarred and fibrotic can they expand well so what will happen? Reduced vital capacity. Or lungs are infiltrated by some infections. Right? Do you think they can expand well? Again, what is there? Reduced vital capacity. Right? Or let's suppose a part of a lung collapse and does not expand again. Can you bring a lot of vital capacity in and out? Again, what is there? Reduced vital capacity. Is that right? Or if there is a fusion here, fluid is full a pathological fluid, excessive fluid is present in pleural cavity and push the lungs like that. Can lungs expand well? What is there? Decrease vital capacity. So what happens? That if lungs are fibrotic or they are collapsed or they are infiltrated or they are pushed by pleural effusion, under all these circumstances, what happens? There is reduced vital capacity. Even if there is excessive fluid inside the lungs, pulmonary edema. If lungs become edematous, edema is excessive fluid, right? Do you think if lungs become wet and boggy and heavy, can you expand them well? No. So again, what is there? Vital capacity is more or less? Less. less. Is that right? There is no pathological condition which increases vital capacity. This is a general rule. Everything which produces disease here reduces vital capacity, right? Okay, only vital capacity is increased after training, I mean physical training, right? Now, so what I'm talking about, it was so easy to understand how vital capacity can be reduced. Either neuronal system is unable to drive the 
inspiratory and expiratory muscles or muscles themselves are in trouble or lung mass substance of the lungs is either fibrotic or collapsed or pushed by the pleural effusion or infiltrated or edematous if all of these things are okay nervous system okay muscular system okay skeletal system okay lung parenchyma is okay but problem is there in the airways there is obstruction to the airways do you think still you can get good vital capacity no so last category of diseases which reduces vital capacity is obstructive lung diseases like asthma right where there is bronchoconstriction or bronchiectasis or we will study later a disease called emphysema or chronic bronchitis these are the diseases where their airways are narrow so can you bring lot of air in and get lot of air out no so what will be happen to vital capacity down so it's so easy to understand what are the causes of reduced vital capacity neuromuscular problems skeletal problems lung substance problem airways problem is that okay any question up to this no after that we go to the changes in lung volumes and capacities in obstructive lung diseases and restrictive lung diseases do you have a concept of obstructive lung diseases and restrictive lung diseases anyone have you heard of it today or not no no, no problem then i will not teach you now uh, this is already recorded into another video which is pulmonary function test right so here we'll stop today and see you next time for lungs mechanics class dismissed